Good morning. Good, good job, y'all. Good morning and welcome to the Ventura Center for Spiritual Living. I'm Reverend Bonnie Rose. It is great to see you here this morning. We're going to start by singing a new song. I don't even know it very well, but Chris is going to help us out by playing the melody real loud. And we're going to stand up. To be still and know that beautiful I am presence that drew us here this morning by divine appointment. Let us honor that as we open our hearts and listen to the words of our sacred reading. My work is Loving the World by Mary Oliver. My work is loving the world. Here are the sunflowers, there the hummingbird, equal seekers of sweetness. Here the quickening yeast, there the blue plums, here the deep clam and the speckled sand. Are my boots old? Is my coat torn? I am no longer young and still not half perfect. Let me keep my mind on what matters, which is my work which is mostly standing still and learning to be astonished. The Phoebe, the Delphinium, the sheep in the pasture, and the pasture, which is mostly rejoicing since all ingredients are here, which is gratitude to be given a mind and a heart and these body clothes, a mouth which which to give shouts of joy to the moth and the wren, to the sleepy dug-in clam, telling them all, over and over, how it is that we will live forever. And so it is. And so. We anchor in the words of the infinite eternal, knowing that another name for this infinite, intimate friend that created everything, that created us, that lives and moves and has its perfect being through us, that this can be called love, spirit, joy, and it is the I am presence. So today we sing together in joyful community, recognizing, remembering the I am presence within each of us. And as we remember for ourselves, we remember for the entire world. May our song bless all beings. I am remembering. I am remembering who I am. The truth of existence, of absolute reality, that is all of us. Let us breathe in deeply and then exhale, gently opening our eyes in love and service to what is, as it is, and so it is. Morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Tom. This is Renee. Home. Home is the place I love. 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 No matter how far I go, whether I'm going fast or going slow, I might be flying high or sinking low. There's only one thing I need to know. You 
can't take the boy from the man And you can't walk alone on this land And if I build my castle on the sand Well, let the children play and they'll understand Um, today we're speaking about astonishment and joy. Uh, and it's based, it was inspired in part by that beautiful reading from Mary Oliver that, that Hugh just did. Um, probably many of you know that Mary Oliver was a great poet. She passed away recently. And uh, I just, I love that poem where it talks about that our, our work is to love the world. And then we do that mostly by standing still and learning to be astonished. Hmm. And as we do that and we recognize all of nature is conspiring to tell us that we will live forever. Are you feeling it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, good, good. It's so, just so beautiful. So, so inspired about this poem and so inspired about doing this talk. And then yesterday, when I got up to hike on the mountain and meditate and figure out what I was going to say, I couldn't think of anything to say. <laughs> that hardly ever happens to me. <laughs> so I'm meditating and I'm saying to myself, well, you know, maybe I shouldn't do a, a, a sermon about astonishment. Maybe I'm not really qualified. I said, I know, God, I'm going to test you. If you want me to do a sermon on astonishment, then you better give me something to be astonished about <laughs> right now. <laughs> and then I woke up and I looked to my left <laughs> And there were the mountains covered with snow. And I looked to my right, and there was, was the ocean that I could see from the top of the mountain with the Channel Islands floating in it so beautifully. And I looked in front of me, and my dog, Sarah Swati, was chasing a bird. <laughs> and I heard the sound of wings, which is always a beautiful sign to me. And I said, oh, sorry, God, my bad. <laughs> I just failed to notice that you are always, are always giving us everything, and everything is astonishing. And you know what I love about that story is that even my failure to be astonished, and by the way, I'm so glad that you failed royally on your way here. I just, I want to hear, or this morning, I want to hear more about that. <laughs> Next time you come, we'll, we'll talk, okay? So we, we love failure in this church. We even have a failure club where you try and fail on purpose. Okay, so <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I, the failure was so beautiful because it, it really illustrated to me the, the, the human condition of what we do. You know, there's this, this Jewish prayer that I love quoting where he talks about how we walk sightless among miracles and that in, in the end that we are clay touched by God. And we exclaim in wonder how filled is awe, how filled with awe is this place. And we do not see it. I have an invitation for all of you today, <laughs> and that is to be filled with awe in this place and to choose to see it, 
to choose to wonder, to choose to be astonished, to choose to be in joy, to choose to love deeply because everything has been given unto us. Part of learning to choose, to choose astonishment and to choose joy is to be cognizant of what gets in the way of our choice of astonishment and joy. Last week I spoke a bit about the early Christian, well, the, the Christian religion after the, when, when it started getting organized, right? And uh, in reading in Richard Rohr, he talked about how a lot, uh, a lot of the influence was from the Romans and the Greeks, and there were the Stoics and the Heroics, and that kind of made people want to be extremely heroic and reach up and out to God like God is not part of the earth, right? And it also made people be kind of Stoic, in that if they suffered enough, if they were just big enough martyrs, then God would be pleased. <laughs> And I'm sure that nobody here is guilty of any of that, correct? Right? <laughs> I think we all do it to a certain extent. You know, I found a really subtle one in myself. I was, I, I, uh, was all excited about what we did at Temple Beth Torah last, last Sunday, where we brought the hearts over to, to the community. And I, on Monday, I woke up, and I, and I was going to do one of those Peter-like small acts of kindness. I did not leave my bathroom better than I found it, by the way, <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> But I did, I did go out and do two anonymous acts of kindness, and, I, and I, I won't tell you what they are because they are somewhat anonymous, but when I was doing them and when I was done, I heard myself say to myself, I literally heard a voice in my head say, well, that can't really be service. It was too much fun. <gasps> <gasps> <laughs> Would anybody else like to come up here and preach the sermon? Because clearly I am not qualified. I do not practice what I preach. So I was talking all about how service is joy and how we're supposed to be, we, we, can, we can learn and endeavor to be joyful in all of our service. You know, so, so there's that. And I, you know, I think that what's happening with, with the human race is that we're trying to do it right. And particularly with spiritual people, <laughs> we're trying to be good enough. We're trying to be spiritual enough. I had a great experience, a great encounter with this over the Christmas holidays. I had some people over to my house for a meal. Um, and first of all, going to my house is a bit of a pilgrimage because um, I live in this house with all of these animals, a little tiny house where the rabbit takes up like a third of the living room because <laughs> his pen is rather big. Because we, we weighed him yesterday. He weighed in at 18.3 pounds. He's a big boy. His name is Bigfoot, and the dogs are milling around, and you're trying to eat, and there's, you know, you're pushing the dogs away with one hand, and uh, Chris was there, and Chris had a nice, tasty plate of hors d'oeuvres that he had selected for himself, and he leaned over to put something on the floor, stuck the plate of hors d'oeuvres out like this, <laughs> and got up, and there was Sarah Swati going, what else you got? <laughs> empty plate, totally empty plate. She ate it all. <laughs> That's Sarah Swati's my dog, <laughs> one of my dogs. So anyway, at, during this gathering, it was a bunch of people that are spiritually inclined, and we were talking about our words for the, words for the year, what we were going to work on this year. Mine was equanimity. I was going to be, uh, have equanimity during the year. Now, my word has already changed because I've, I've mastered that. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This one in the front laughed a little too loudly because he, he lives with me, he knows what it's like. But you know, there, there were words like, we're gonna, it, we're gonna, uh, I'm, gonna be, I'm gonna have equanimity, I'm going to stop criticizing, I'm going to be less judgmental. All of these kind of serious words, very serious words that kind of felt to me in the moment like perhaps we were making a false god out of self-improvement. Now self-improvement is not a horrible thing, but it comes much e more easily through self-acceptance and through something else. Because in this conversation, one of those sitting among us, amongst us mentioned that God intoxication was what this person was going for, right? God intoxication. In this service, in this church, we call it ishq, which is an Arabic word. Ishq Allah, mabud ilah, or ishq Allah, mabud Allah means God is love, lover, and beloved. And ishq is God intoxication, which is Astonishment and joy, ongoing astonishment and joy. And in that moment at my house with the big rabbit hopping around and the guinea pig squeaking and the dogs eating hors d'oeuvres, I realized that ishk, God astonishment, was the answer to all of those words. So often, 
We put self-improvement first, and then we'll be in love with, with life and in love with love. That's kind of like deciding that you're going to ride a bicycle, and you need to develop balance before you actually get on the bicycle, right? You develop balance when you're on the bicycle. You have to get on the bicycle, right? <coughs> So, so if we practice ishk, if we practice God intoxication, if we practice joy and astonishment, all of those other things start taking care of themselves. You cannot help but be loving. You cannot help but be kind. You cannot help to release some of your judgment when you are filled with the intoxication of love. The question is, how do we do it in a practical manner? I'm taking the Busting Loose from the Money Game class with Reverend Patrick Harbula, and every week he reminds us to ask ourselves, what will bring me the most joy? When we're making a decision, not what is most practical, what will make my grandmother happy, what will make whoever happy, what will, what will bring me the most joy? What will bring me the most joy? And I would also invite you to, to make time every day to be astonished, to take a moment to pause, to just breathe and look at something and find the astonishment in it. It takes regular practice. It takes regular choice making along the way of joy. It takes simply being and recognizing that the love of spirit is who you are right now that we don't really have to go outside of ourselves to reach it. It's like me on the mountain saying, God, show me a sign, and then the signs are all around me, right? The other thing is to believe, <laughs> to believe that the ultimate nature of reality is joy and astonishment, to change our perception. You know, here in this center, we talk a lot about absolute reality, that we all have relative thoughts and that we all impose them upon, upon this absolute reality. I saw a great quote by uh, David Bohm, who's a quantum physicist. I'll paraphrase it. He said that what we call thinking is usually just a constant rearrangement of our prejudices. <laughs> or biases or perceptions. What we call thinking is a constant rearrangement of our, our biases and perceptions. But then Albert Einstein, another great physicist, said, that we have to decide whether or not the universe is friendly or unfriendly. And a bumper sticker in, where was that, San Francisco said, if you are not in awe, you are not paying attention. <laughs> I encountered another spiritual prophet this past week or so that had some good things to say about belief. This was Alan Arkin. The actor <laughs> did not encounter him personally, but I was I was looking for a book. I had to do a long commute, and I was looking for an audible book to listen to while I was driving. And I was like, "Just get me away from spiritual books, please. I read them all the time. Give me something that's not spiritual." <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know, good luck with that, really, because I, I the Alan Arkin book um, popped into my into my feed, and I, it sounded good. It's called Out of Your Mind, and I, and I purchased it, and I listened to it. You, you guys all know who Alan Arkin is? Do you ever see Little Miss Sunshine? <laughs> he's the nasty grand, grandpa in that, and he's in, a, in another show called uh, The Kaminsky Method, right? Yeah, good, good, really good actor. But anyway, I was trying, I was getting away from the spiritual path. I was a little psyched to hear about the life of this skanky old actor, right? And, <laughs> and, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> My husband, is, he's an actor. <laughs> yeah, and, <laughs> because I've known one or two in my time. And, <laughs> and, uh, and it's, it's a book all about his spiritual path. It's a book about how when it's three, three ideologies that he embraced fully, he said that when he was a young man that he embraced uh, like sort of socialist justice and, and he was determined to change the world with that. And it didn't happen, the world didn't change. And then he went to psychotherapy Oh, and he thought that if he could just per per persuade enough people to get in touch with their Oedipal complexes, then the world would change. That didn't work either. <laughs> and then he went to the Eastern religions, Hinduism, and, and he, he studied that. And he said, oh, my goodness, if I can just persuade people that this is all an illusion, if this is all an illusion, then that will change the world. And he tried and he tried, but he couldn't change the world that way. And so finally, he came up with this idea that belief, belief is often <laughs> largely just 
a wish system. It's a system of how we wish things were. And so he decided to, that's an odd thing for a minister to say, right? But it is, I, I hear it. It's often because, you know, you look at people who believe differently from you, right? These people are going to heaven, these are not, that kind of thing. You're like, you wish, <laughs> you know? And we may be doing the same thing. <laughs> we may be doing the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so Alan Arkin decided to come up with immu any immutable laws, any immutable beliefs that, were, that he was just so sure were true, and he came up with two of them. The first one was everything changes. The second one was, let me see if I can channel my inner Alan Arkin. You can never have too much garlic in your food. <laughs> So I was talking about this with my nephew, my nephew who is an atheist, at least he thinks he is. <laughs> he, we don't believe in the same God. I mean, we, I mean, we do believe in the same God, he just doesn't call it God. We believe in science, we believe in energy, we believe in wholeness, he believes in love, I believe in love. So he calls himself an atheist and he was, he was saying, well, Bonnie, Bonnie, seriously, I mean, what can you believe in? What do you absolutely know is true? Beyond what Alan Arkin said, because I believe what Alan Arkin said too, especially the part about the garlic, whoo! And then, <laughs> but, I, but as soon as he said it, just, just, just flew out of my mouth, and, he, and I said, David, I believe in the compost cycle. <laughs> yes. yes, can I hear a hallelujah? <laughs> okay, thank you, <laughs> thank you. I believe in the compost cycle. I believe in the compost cycle with my whole heart because the compost cycle is so beautiful. Does everybody know what the compost cycle is? Okay, just in case you don't, it's when you take your food scraps, you take your eggshells, you take your what else? Coffee grounds, yes, coffee grounds. And you throw it in a bin, and sometimes you got some worms in there, and it makes all of this dead stuff, makes beautiful soil that you put on other plants to grow live stuff. That is exactly what Mary Oliver was talking about, where the whole world is persuading us that everything lives forever. That dead coffee ground that you drank a week ago, two weeks ago, is now making fertilizer that makes beautiful food. Is that not exciting or what? This, yes, yes, I'm so excited, I'm so excited. This is a metaphor for all of us. We are all the compost cycle in action. The whole universe is a compost cycle in action. And the truth is, is that the compost cycle is just another word for wholeness. It is another word for wholeness. So I can get excited about wholeness because I believe in the compost cycle and I believe that everything has a purpose and everything, even if we don't like it, even if they're struggling in the world, even if they're suffering in the world, I can be in joy and astonishment of the wholeness that exists inherent in everything. Okay, thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> yes, so my question was, can you be that excited about something? Can you find something true in your life? Maybe it's that you love your children so much. Maybe it's that you love the feel of the ocean or the smell of the ocean or you love surfing or you love golfing. Maybe it's, I don't know, that you love books so much, that you love the mystery of words. It's gotta be something because there is so much here to be astonished about. You know, when I started thinking deeper on this topic about loving the compost cycle and loving the, the um, the mountain that I was in and, the, and seeing the ocean, I started thinking about all kinds of things to be astonished about. You know, think about, think about families, all of the, the ups and the downs and all of the, the, the drama and the trauma in families and all of the love in families, it's all incredibly beautiful. Think about music. I mean, music is so, so amazing that somebody came up with that. Somebody came up with this, this idea of beating on a skin of an animal on a drum and that turned into this diversity, this multiplicity. It turned into John Cross blowing on his horn, and are you awake, are you awake John? No, maybe not, okay. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you know, tra traveling all over the world, blowing on his, on his saxes, and just, just bringing joy to so many people, right? Is, there is, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. <laughs> I, told, I told Hugh I wasn't prepared for this talk, and, the, and that Ish, the, the stage manager, the holy stage manager in the sky was gonna have to do it. I hope I'm doing okay because I'm loving this talk right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what I, what I want for you guys is to feel that excitement about something in your life and then start to see it ripple out because it will ripple out if you allow it. See, that's the thing about joy and astonishment. It will not come unless you welcome it. Welcome it.
And so we have to welcome it. We have to constantly make the choice, and we have to constantly look for reasons, asking in everything that happens through us or to us, what is the joy? What is the astonishment on this? And then, how can I share it? Because joy and astonishment grows through sharing. We happen to have an expert on this topic, on joy and astonishment, in our spiritual center. We have many experts, I, I presume, but I'm calling forth one of our experts, our fixer of heat and our ama amazing gardener, Mr. Norm Fort, to come forward and read to us. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. I got so excited her talking about the compost cycle that it's <laughs> kind of hard for me to concentrate on what I <laughs> wanted to say. I was uh, just working at my desk earlier this week, one of the days when it was raining. Had to get a report out, so I was procrastinating as much as I could by reading other things that I'd written. <laughs> and I came across this piece that I was really, really quite astonished. And I'll explain to you why after I, after I read it. But it was just something that I wanted to share with you. <clears throat> and it's written in dialogue, so it's a two-part dialogue between myself and a friend. And I'll indicate my friend speaking, and then the response would be me talking, OK? And before I get into reading this, there's a couple of lines between the wife and I about where I'm going to be. So I try to let her know, you know, when I'm out wandering around the pasture or whatever. So here we go, OK? Uh, Good morning, wife. I'll be in the garden if you're looking for me. The wife responds, it's really early. It's just barely daybreak. And I respond, I know, but that's one of the very best times of the day. Okay, here starts the dialogue, okay. Good morning. It's such an incredibly beautiful day. Thank you so very much for the rain. Everything is so clean and new looking after being washed by the rain. Friend, you're welcome. I'm glad you're aware of some of these things that happen in nature. I have some lines from a poem that keep going through my head that I'd like to share with you. Friend, sure, I'm always interested in your thoughts and poems and different things you read that cause you to ponder beyond ordinary, everyday thoughts. Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I will meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. It's a line from Remy's poem, of course. A friend, Remy's a very interesting fellow. I always appreciate his thoughts. When I think about the field that Remy speaks of, to me it's a garden. That's my friend. That's an interesting comment. Why do you think of Rumi's field as a garden. The world seems to be in real turmoil right now. Politicians and others are fighting amongst themselves and calling each other bad names. It seems that the various groups are putting a lot of energy into trying to hurt each other. If these arrogant, self-centered people would just get together and plant some gardens. Or start their own garden. They might find their soul and stop being so human. Friend, this behavior that humans exhibit is so very temporary. It may seem to you like it goes on for a long time, but to me it's so brief I hardly notice it. I do agree with you though that people would be a lot happier and nicer if they would simply go beyond themselves and work in a garden, or simply just get closer to nature. Friend, changing the subject, I have a few surprises for you. The broccoli began to form heads last night, 
and the potatoes have finished growing, so you can take some with you for breakfast. Oh yeah, I almost forgot, Snap Peas woke up and found their first son this morning. They'll be blooming soon. I feel very close to you when I'm working in the garden. It's so quiet and peaceful here, friend. I appreciate that you enjoy the garden, but your state of mind is something of your own making. You can be peaceful and you can be close to me anywhere. There's something else that's been on my mind for quite a while now. My wife and I have dogs and cats that we have rescued from some really terrible circumstances. Through the years, they grow old and pass beyond our lives. We use the expression Rainbow Bridge to comfort our sadness and imagine that they're waiting there for us to reunite when we pass. Can you tell me what really happens? Friend, it's difficult to explain because being human, your mind and your thoughts are so limited. But let me try. When one of your loved ones comes home to me, I pair them with a human soul so they can continue to share love just as they did when they were with you. Then when your soul comes home and reunites with theirs, the love that you held in your heart as a memory continues just as it did when they were here with you on earth. It's difficult for you to understand this because you think of confining spatial concepts. It may help you to realize that souls do not occupy space. They're simply a part of all creation. I'm glad you explained that to me. I felt sad about them just waiting for me. But now that I know the love continues and is shared, I really look forward to our forever reunion. Friend, anything else on your mind that you'd like to talk to me about this morning? No, not really. I think I'll go in now and fix some potatoes with my breakfast, so bye for now. Friend, not really. <laughs> You know, I'm always with you. When you're in a quiet place like this garden or other places in nature, you're just more aware of my presence. So, I found this piece that I had written in May of 2017. I was so astonished when I read that because I wrote it well over a year before the garden was put in the ramp and the gardens that we have for the bunnies in the back, uh, well over a year before that even existed. Now, the broccoli in the garden's formed heads, it's ready to be picked, cauliflower's making heads, the potatoes are beginning to come up. I'm getting excited just talking about this. <laughs> Some tomatoes are ripe, and the snap peas and the money garden are in bloom and have snap peas on the vines. So I was thinking about it, and I was thinking, God is so good. I love you guys very much, and I would ask you along the lines of Mary Oliver, pay attention, be astonished, and talk about it. If you happen to go out today and go down the ramp, look over the side. The cauliflower, the heads of the cauliflower, incredibly beautiful in the rain with the raindrops. Uh, the broccoli uh, is blooming. And there's a compost box out there, too. <laughs> so, thank you very much, guys. <laughs> Let us pray. Uh, 
I invite you to turn within and just breathe into all of the beauty that has been shared this morning. Through words, through music, through sacred readings, through prayer, through fellowship, through friendship, through goodwill, through acts of kindness. It is all that astonishing presence that we call love. Love is here this morning. And as Norm so eloquently said, love is always with us. Love is with us always. And so we anchor in that truth that, know, that knows that love is wholeness, that love is grace, that love is joy, that love is astonishment. And we allow ourselves to merge into that knowing so that it changes our lives from the inside out. We get on the bicycle, we find our balance, we find our fullness, we find our ishk, we find our appreciation of wholeness, we find our astonishment, we find our joy simply by asking, Spirit, reveal joy unto me. Love, astonish me with your love so that I may astonish you with my love. We give and receive forever and ever in this beautiful cycle of giving and receiving, knowing that they are one and the same, knowing that death and life are the same, that they are all embraced in this beautiful, beautiful thing that we call wholeness. And this truth changes us at depth. And so we give thanks for it. We give thanks for the true words that have been spoken, for the fellowship that is so true. We give thanks for this Sunday experience and for the spirit of love that goes with us always. This morning, I bless this teaching. I bless all beings here. I bless all paths to God. Synagogues, churches, temples, mosques, ashrams, fundamentalists, atheists, I bless all of them for all beings are a blessing. And with a heart that is so filled with blessedness, so filled with gratitude and love, I release these words into the divine mystery of wholeness, into the law that says yes. And together we say, and so it is. I am so blessed, I am so blessed, I am so grateful for all that I have. Just a little bit of me, just a little bit of you There's enough to go around You make me laugh when I'm feeling blue Nothing's gonna bring me down When I'm with you and you're with me My heart is free You're my, you're my, you're my you're my kindred, you're my, you're my, you're my. You're my kindred, you're my, you're my, you're my. You're my kindred. All we really want to do is find a place, a place where we belong, not a place we need to chase. Just a place to sing our song when I'm with you and you're with me. My heart is free. Ooh. You're my, you're my, you're my. You're my kindred, you're my, you're my, you're my. Sing with us. You're my kindred, you're my, you're my, you're my. You're my kindred You're my kindred With you I don't need to worry I don't need to worry With you are my tribe You are my family, my tribe We laugh, laugh we sing, we make harmony so glad you're mine. Here we go. You're my, you're my, you're my. You're my kindred. You're my, you're my, you're my. You're my kindred, you're my, you're my, you're my. 
You're my kindred. You're my, you're my, you're my. You're my. Do 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 do. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Please feel free to go through those doors there and get some delicious refreshments. Let's do our affirmations and then we'll sing. Please repeat after me. We are a center of love. We are love. We share love. We serve love. Love is who we are. Thank you for my love. Thank you for my life. <laughs>